Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning services. So these services are open to all and they take place every Sunday at the same time. Each week we have a great speaker who speaks on one aspect of the Baha'i faith. Today we'll start by playing a poem by Saadi, which is set to music by international musicians. And then we'll follow that with a reading from the Baha'i faith. Sono parte di un unico corpo, provengono dalla stessa perla. Quando una delle parti soffre di qualche male, anche le altre provano dolore. Non puoi considerarti parte dell'umanità se non hai compassione di quel dolore. This limitless universe is like the human body. 
all the members of which are connected and linked with one another with the greatest strength. How much the organs, the members and the parts of the body of man are intermingled and connected for mutual aid and help, and how much they influence one another. In the same way, the parts of this infinite universe have their members and elements connected with one another and influence one another spiritually and materially. Abdul Baha. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. And I just want to um, say that we'll have a Q&A session after the talk. So please save your questions for then. And please use the chat function in Zoom to ask your questions and we'll try to get to as many people as possible. So this week, our speaker is Mr. Rain Wilson and his topic is Transcendence, Where Art and Faith Converge. Rain Wilson is best known for playing the role of Dw Dwight Schrute on NBC's The Office. Additional film and television credits include Galaxy Quest, Almost Famous, The Rocker, Super, Six Feet Under, Juno, Backstrom, Star Trek Discovery, Tom Paine, The Meg, Mom, and Don't Tell a Soul. He will also be appearing in the forthcoming series, Utopia and the Power. Wilson co-founded Soul Pancake, a digital media company, and the Lied Foundation, an educational initiative in rural Haiti that empowers at-risk women and girls through the arts. And with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Wilson. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. Well, hello, hello, hello. And um, my deepest apologies to everyone. A couple weeks ago, I was booked as the speaker and in the middle of moving. I'm in my house I moved into two days ago and, and with everything else going on, wires got crossed and, um, and basically I didn't show up. So I'm very sorry about that. I'm sorry to have left anyone hanging that was uh, waiting for me that early morning. Thank you for coming back. Um, I would love to, uh, there's an awful lot of people who don't have their video on. Maybe they haven't done their hair yet or something like that. Maybe, or, or maybe they're cooking breakfast and this is on in the background, but I'd love to have all your videos on and then we can go a gallery view and um, it helps me give the talk because it allows me to kind of see the faces. These Zoom conversations are, uh, really cool in a lot of ways, but they're also really tricky in a lot of ways because, you know, when you, as a speaker, you get a vibe off the room, you know, you, you can tell like people kind of gravitate towards a certain kind, certain topics, and then maybe pull away from others, or they seem to like the heavier stuff more, or they seem to like the lighter stuff more. It's really tricky on, um, on Zoom to get a read of the room. Uh, so seeing your faces is very helpful to me. So thank you very much. Um, I wanted to start by saying, well, first of all, that was an incredibly beautiful song. I, I thought that was, in, when it started, I was like, oh, is this like a Persian folk song or something like that? And then it just expanded and expanded uh, across the globe and, um, and the way that you guys tied it in with that Baha'i quote, that wonderful Baha'i quote about unity of the human reality of people on earth being like the unity of the body of all of these component, diverse component parts, each doing their job and working together in harmony. And the way that worked with the song, I thought was just really beautiful and very, it was very soul stirring. Um, I really want to find the link. Maybe you can put the link down to that song because I, I would really love to to share that with folks too. I thought it was, it was very beautiful. And the, the lyrics were very beautiful. And the lyrics about like, if you hurt one limb, you'll hurt all the limbs, you know? And I think that's one thing that's going on right now in the world is uh, one limb is, is being hurt and it's really hurting all the limbs. Now you can certainly put that in the perspective of the coronavirus, but more specifically in terms of the issues around social justice and around oppression of uh, 
African Americans, systemic racism in the United States specifically, and institutionalized racism that is hurting this one limb that's in a lot of pain. And this is, um, it's not gonna be the topic of my talk today, but I just wanna acknowledge it because it's so um, raw right now. And uh, it feels honestly a little weird right now to be talking about anything else other than social justice. Um, there's a lot of topics in this world to discuss in the, in the spiritual milieu, but what's happening with social justice um, is so prevalent and so like it's a it's a throbbing nerve it has been i believe i'm told by my friends of people of color that you know for hundreds of years um and it's easy for me in my kind of white bubble of privilege in suburban la to not really have to think about it or worry about it and this last inflammation of this centuries-long painful oppression has uh really um, got me thinking on a number of different levels. And recently I've had the good pleasure of doing some talks around this topic, um, trying to also amplify uh, voices of people of color that maybe haven't been as heard before. And um, so I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that because it's kind of the, the elephant in the room of what's going on culturally right now. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, says, be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age you live in. Be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age you live in and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. So focus your conversation on the needs and requirements of, of the age that you live in. And this is a spiritual call to arms because Baha'is believe that these issues can be addressed through a spiritual lens uh, as well as other lenses of, let's say, passing laws, legislation, etc. cetera. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that and, but we're going to talk about something a little bit different, but maybe it's all related. Maybe it all comes together again, like the various limbs and components of the human body. Maybe it's all connected in the end. Um, first of all, I want to say to whatever folks out there that might know very, very little about the Baha'i Faith, I want to just do a little brief introduction about what the Baha'i Faith is in case you just showed up and you're like, yeah, I heard the guy who played Dwight is going to be on the Zoom in Virginia. Uh, and he just <laughs> showed up and you don't know what is going on like what are they talking about bodies and justice and music and weird sounding names so let me let me uh fill you in a little bit on on the baha'i faith for those of you who don't know um so it's very difficult by the way to encapsulate the baha'i faith in a short amount of time because it's a it's a huge area of study you could spend your entire life studying it and not get even close to the bottom of it but if I were to try to put it in a nutshell, I would say that um, there, the Baha'is believe there is only one God and that this God, the all, an all seeing, all loving, all creative force in the universe. This is not like an old white man on a cloud with a beard type of God. This is like a, a God that <clears throat> is beyond all comprehension that exists beyond time and space, <clears throat> excuse me, and is uh, essentially unknowable. That this God brought humanity into being, just like he brought this entire universe into being and an infinite other universes into being beyond this one, that this God has chosen to educate humanity spiritually through sending down specially appointed divine teachers throughout time. So these divine teachers have come from the dawn of man and will continue to go for as long as man is around on this planet. Um, you may have heard some of these names like Abraham or Krishna, Zoroaster, um, 
Moses, the Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and now Baha'is believe in a new divine teacher for this day and age named Baha'u'llah, whose name means the glory of God. And Baha'u'llah lived in Persia, he was born in Persia uh, in the mid 1800s um, and spent his entire life being tortured, imprisoned, banished from country to country to country. He ultimately lived and died in the Baha'i Holy Land in Palestine, now Israel. Uh, and this is the Baha'i Holy Land of Haifa, Israel. And um, Baha'i, and so another analogy that Baha'is often use for these divine teachers are divine physicians. So we're using the analogy of the body again and uh, the body occasionally needs to be healed. Things are out of balance. So you go to the doctor and what does the doctor do? He does a two part thing. He diagnoses and prescribes. So the doctor shows up, looks around and says, oh, your, your liver is inflamed and your right eye is infected and you're, you've got a cut on your pinky finger or whatever it is the issues are and then prescribes the remedy for those parts of the body. And that's how these divine teachers work. So Baha'u'llah, seeing the state of humanity in the 19th century and seeing how this would go into the 20th and 21st centuries, has prescribed spiritual solutions to the world's problems. And many of these issues are dealt with in Baha'u'llah's central teachings and the elimination of racial prejudice, um, the establishment of justice being central to the Baha'i teachings because it is through justice that we have a portal to unity. And ultimately, unity is where it's all at. That's what we're going for. In fact, maybe that's the theme of today, today's talk is, uh, is unity. So uh, the, the equality of women and men, um, the elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty, um, the essential harmony of science and religion. And there's many, many other teachings, all with the point of creating unity among humanity. And there are great, terrible things going on in the world right now. Some of them can be fixed, at least temporarily, with elections, legislation and more just governments and things like that. And that's super important and crucial. But there are deeper issues that divide us that can only really be healed through a spiritual solution. And this is what Baha'is believe that Baha'u'llah has brought. So as a Baha'i, I'm also a Christian. As a Baha'i, I'm also a Muslim. As a Baha'i, I'm also a Buddhist because I believe that their divine teachers and their word is the word of God. Um, I choose to follow Baha'u'llah specifically as well as these other divine teachers because I feel that his, uh, his teachings are the most specific and relevant to 2020 in the United States. There's a lot more to it than that. One, thing, one other thing I'll say is that there's no clergy in the Baha'i faith. So, so pa Paimane and, and me and other people helping put this together. Uh, we're not clergy or we're not priests or rabbis or mullahs or anything like that. We're just, so anything that I say, there's probably 37 other Baha'is that would say, oh, I would say it totally different or I don't view it that way or I would say it like this. So um, that's okay too. So this is, this is part of the process that uh, Baha'is have a, a Kind of a little more democratic view of interpreting and interpolating the holy writings of Baha'u'llah. So let's get on to the topic a little bit. And um, there is a chat function at the bottom. And we're, I'm, I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal story. And then I'm going to get a little bit into art and transcendence. I'm just going to dip my toe in. Um, it's a very complicated uh, topic. Um, but basically, I grew up, this is a very long story, very, very short. So this is a very addended, is that a word? 
um, amended uh, version of my story, but I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith. My parents became Baha'is in the 60s. There was a tremendous surge of growth in the Baha'i faith in the 60s and 70s, when the world was kind of similar to the, w the way it is right now. People are searching, people are a bit lost. The Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, uh, the, the, uh, which led to the elimination of those terrible Jim Crow laws um, and uh, a kind of explosion in this counterculture that started to question everything and started to look at spirituality in a new and different way. Like maybe there is answer to be found on a spiritual path. You know, the, Boodle, the Beatles met with the Maharishi and Cat Stevens became a Muslim and many people were exploring uh, different spiritual paths. And that's what my parents did. So it was beautiful growing up in the Baha'i faith because I learned all these wonderful kind of progressive spiritual teachings and about loving one another and we're all one human family and the importance and centrality of service um, toward worship and towards you know one's purpose of being alive. And basically, again, very long story, very, very short, when I uh, decided to become an actor and moved to New York City to study acting, I really jettisoned everything having to do with Baha'i faith, faith in general, religion in general, God in general, anything like that. I just wanted to move to New York City and be an actor and kind of do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. I was rebelling against my parents. I kind of issued them. I saw some hypocrisy in the Baha'is that drove me crazy and I rejected that, um, kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater in a way and went to New York City and to become an actor. I went to NYU and studied intensely for many years and did lots of little productions that no one saw and um, what I basically, what basically happened for me is that I kind of thought, you know, I, I grew up a Baha'i and fervently believed that the Baha'i faith could change the world in a positive aspect. And as I worked in the theater, I kind of had that same fervor for art. I thought, I realize now in retrospect that that's what I was doing. So I rejected the Baha'i faith and I turned entirely toward um, art. And we thought that we could change the world by doing theater. We thought that if we did the right production of the three sisters in the right church basement for the right 27 people, that we could just open their hearts and blow their minds and, um, and absolutely uh, affect them uh, in a positive way. And, and this was good in a way because it fueled my artistic endeavors in a similar way as my spiritual endeavors had been fueled previously, which is, I guess it boils down to this. In the Baha'i faith, we learn eventually that we are on a twofold moral path, that we are on a path towards making ourselves better people, living a, a richer, more fulfilled, more balanced life, seeking to emulate the virtues, the qualities of God, like patience and love and humility and kindness. And we seek to grow and nurture this in our hearts. And at the same time, the other part of this path is to make the world a better place, um, to be of service to humanity. And like I, like I mentioned earlier, you know, to be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age you live in and to center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements, to, to focus your work on helping to make the world a better place at the same time. So um, the, I was essentially doing just that with theater. I was you know, trying to make myself a better actor and we thought we could change the world by doing theater. So again, there was this kind of twofold spiritual path that many Baha'is take that I was taking as a young actor. Again, long story short, excuse me, 
Time for a refreshing beverage. Thank you. Um, uh, long story short, I started to become a professional actor and this was beyond my wildest dreams. I didn't know any artists growing up. I didn't know any professional actors. I didn't come from a family of actors or people that got paid for doing art. Um, and this was beyond my wildest dreams. And yet I was very unhappy. Um, this could be a whole other talk. I'm not going to kind of go down that road, but I found myself working as an actor, getting jobs. I wasn't making any real money at it, but I was working and had an agent and was auditioning. And, um, uh, and at the same time, I was really unhappy. And this didn't make any sense to me because I kind of thought like, well, if I go to acting school and I become an actor and then I'm working as an actor and I'm living my dream in New York City, being a bohemian, trying to make the world a better place by putting on plays, then that will be so fulfilling that I will be happy. But I wasn't. I was uh, uh, quite the opposite. And so this got me thinking about spirituality in a, in a deeper way. And so I explored um, uh, many aspects of spirituality. And basically, again, super long story, super short. I read a lot of the holy writings of the world's religions and studied the world's religions. And I started thinking about kind of life's biggest questions, like, is there a God? What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? And, um, and essentially came back to the Baha'i faith and was reading the Baha'i faith. And as I had grown up in the Baha'i faith, I did some study groups and Sunday schools and summer schools and whatnot, but I hadn't done a really deep dive into the main teachings and writings of Baha'u'llah and his son, Abdul Baha, and his predecessor, the Bab, and many, many other great Baha'i historians and spiritual teachers. And so in so doing, I came back to the Baha'i faith. But most importantly, and this is the point of the talk, is I uncovered some teachings that I was not aware of previously that really blew my mind. And that has to do with uh, the Baha'i faith and the arts and the centrality of the arts with the Baha'i faith. And it also had to do with the, another central teaching of the Baha'i faith that I didn't mention before, which is called the individual investigation of truth. That is to say, Baha'u'llah has said in this day and age that everyone must find the truth for themselves. Now, this may sound pretty obvious. You know, you might just be like, well, duh, of course, I'm going to find the truth for myself. I'm, I'm going to take a gap year and I'm going to go kayaking and I'm going to take this meditation class and I'm going to read, you know, the people's history of the United States by Howard Zinn. And I'm going to like find the truth for myself. But this was extremely revolutionary uh, coming in the Middle East in the 19th century, uh, where no one found the, the truth for themselves. Um, your great grandfather and your grandfather and your father went to the mosque on the corner, then you were going to the mosque on the corner. And if your great grandfather and grandfather and father were you know, watchmakers, then you were going to be a watchmaker. There's not, you didn't have a choice. You would say like, you know what? I'm not going to be a watchmaker. I'm going to go be a tour guide in Nepal. It's like, what? No, you, you don't, you don't have that choice. So I realized that my sojourn being an actor in New York city was part of my journey to find the truth for myself, that I needed to go down this path in order to find uh, the truth, which for me was, uh, coming back to the Baha'i faith. Now, there's a lot more to this central teaching of the in individual investigation of truth than just that. It, 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 it has a lot of layers and depths and complexity to it that we don't have time to get into right now. But the quotes about the arts were really uh, super interesting. I'm going to share some quotes. Oops. What did I just do? There we go. 
I'm going to just share a couple quotes to kind of get us going and just warm us up and then talk about a few uh, quotes from the Baha'i Faith about the arts that uh, were great, greatly uplifting and inspiring to me at the time. So, hold on. Again, there's a chat function at the bottom. If you guys have questions, we'll have uh, time for questions at the end and uh, make, it, make this a little more interactive. No, I don't wanna share my mail inbox. Here we go. Here's just some fun quotes about art. Are you guys seeing that? Thumbs up, you're seeing that? Quotes on the screen, okay. These are some quotes that just uh, generally inspire me. Um, Seek to know the power that is within you, says the Buddha. If you can imagine it, it exists, says Pablo Picasso. Art is not an end in itself. It introduces the soul into a higher spiritual order which it expresses and in some sense explains. Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton, the great Catholic mystic, uh, one of the greatest poets and writers of the Catholic tradition of all time. Um, his work is incredibly in alignment with the Baha'i faith. If people want to dig into the writings of Thomas Merton. He essentially united the Catholic tradition with Buddhism, and Taoism and Hinduism. But I love this idea because art is not an end in itself. It introduces the soul into a higher spiritual order, which it expresses and in some sense explains. So two part process. Art evokes the mystery without which the world would not exist. Art evokes the mystery without which the world would not exist. And here's a beautiful quote from Baha'u'llah. This is from the Seven Valleys, a mystical work of his, where he quotes the Imam Ali, the fourth Imam of uh, Islam. The Shiites believe should have been the first Imam. Uh, a great writer, philosopher, thinker, prophet. Dost thou reckon thyself only a puny form when within thee the universe is folded? Dost thou reckon thyself only a puny form when within thee the universe is folded? So these are just, these quotes are just an amuse-bouche. They're just there to warm the palate a little bit. And then I'd like to get to, to this quote that I found when I was coming back into the Baha'i faith, that for me, a number of light bulbs went off. This is from a letter from Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha was the eldest son of Baha'u'llah and was a leader of the Baha'i faith for a long period of time. And actually came to America in 1912 for almost a year he spent in North America. And uh, incredible speaker, philosopher, spiritual leader, and Baha'is love and hold his writings as being very close to those of his fathers. I rejoice to hear, this was in a letter. I rejoice to hear that thou hast taken pains with thine art, for in this wonderful new age, art is worship. The more thou strivest to perfect it, the closer wilt thou come to God. What bestowal could be greater than this, that one's art should be even as the act of worshiping the Lord? That is to say, when thy fingers grasp the paintbrush, it is as if thou wert at prayer in the temple. So in this wondrous new age, Abdu'l-Baha says art is worship. 
The more you strive to perfect it, the closer you come to God. What bestowal could be greater than this, that one's art should be even as the act of worshiping the Lord? That is to say, when your fingers grasp the paintbrush, it is as if that worked at prayer in the temple. So this really got me thinking. Again, I had come across writings about the ind independent investigation of truth and how important and central it was to find the truth for oneself and that that's the journey I had been on. But then also I realized I was on a journey trying to perfect my art. I was, I had not perfected it by any means, but I was trying to become a better and better actor I was trying to make the world a better place with my art. And uh, then I realized that, you know, in the Baha'i faith, art is the same as worship. So really all of that time that I had spent away from the Baha'i faith, um, I had spent on a journey of self-discovery an independent investigation of truth and also trying to perfect an art, an art that is the same as prayer. So really that those years, those 10 years had been uh, in an act of prayer and an act of worship. This led uh, later on when I was doing the television show, The Office, I started with some Baha'i friends of mine. We started a, a media company called Soul Pancake that was referenced in my bio. You may or may not have heard of it. Uh, essentially now it's a YouTube channel and a Facebook page and a kind of works uh, creating content and for social media. Uh, it started as a website where people could interact with and post life's big questions and um, uh, interact with each other about deep philosophical and spiritual themes. And when we were trying to start it, these were the two teachings of the Baha'i faith that inspired Soul Pancake. Were, they were the independent investigation of truth and the fact that art is worship. And we wanted to blend these two things that were so important to my development and create a, a web destination and a media company that could um, uh, explore and explode those themes. And I remember I was on the set of, of The Office and I was talking to Ed Helms, who's an actor on The Office, and he was like, um, hey, what's this soul pancake thing I've been hearing about? And I was like, well, it's, it's a place where we want to um, blend arts and spirituality. And he said, aren't those things mutually exclusive? And, and I was like, well, I don't think so. And, but, and, and this is not a knock on Ed Helms, who's a very spiritual guy and a great artist, but this is a common kind of misconception in contemporary society that um, that art and spirituality are two separate paths. And I think this has been oftentimes because of very conservative uh, religions that haven't allowed art or the expression of art. And that spirituality is different than say religion. You can be spiritual without being a member of any religion. Um, and as I started to think about this, I started to think about this idea of transcendence. And I started to think about this longing that I've always had in my heart to know and understand why I've been put here. Maybe not so much in a philosophical way, like I've taken philosophy classes and they're moderately interesting to me, but in some greater way, uh, as was uh, Thomas Merton says, to uh, introduce the soul into a higher spiritual order, which expresses uh, and, and explains this higher spiritual order. And it's through this intersection of art and faith that um, I personally have uh, spent the, the main part of the journey of my life. One, I have a few more quotes to share and then we can take some more questions um, or we'll take some questions at last. 
the at home started me thinking about how compartmentalized we are and how compartmentalized I was that I had my professional life, you know, my career as an actor over here. And then I had my uh, artistic uh, goals as an actor. Then I had my spiritual life over here. Then my, my friends were over here. My family was over here. My hobbies were over here. And uh, all of these things were in different compartments. And I started thinking about, uh, and it brings me back to the Baha'i teachings on unity of the body that was read at the beginning of this conversation. The unity and interactivity of all the organs and members and parts of the body working together in harmony. Um, how can I at long last separate my, uh, all of this, this disunity in my life and to come into integrity and integration where my artistic expression, my faith, as I came back to the Baha'i faith, my family life, you know, how I behave, you know, who I am as a person is all united. And this, when I was on the spiritual path, I did a, a great deal of studying of uh, Native American spirituality. And it got me thinking a lot about the Native American view on both art and spirituality, where they're inextricably linked. There is not a difference. If you go into a museum and you see a pot that was made by a Native American tribe or a rug, the rug is utilitarian. People would sleep on it. It was a work of art that would spend, people would spend months making or years making with incredible patterns in these Navajo or Hopi rugs, let's say. And it's also an artistic expression that there's things woven in that have to do with God and the great, the great mystery, the great power, um, and also nature. So it might be a mountain, and that mountain is synonymous with God, is synonymous with nature, is synonymous with their ancestors, and coming to bear in this rug that was also very practical and that would be trod on and stepped on. It wasn't put in a museum or something like that. So this complete holistic integration of all of these aspects. And this is what I was came to believe was kind of my life's mission was to integrate these things. So people ask me a lot about Dwight and they say like, what's that like being a Baha'i and playing Dwight or is Dwight spiritual or, you know, because Dwight, for those of you who don't know, is kind of the least spiritual human being on the planet and on the television show, The Office, um, you know, comic sidekick is kind of annoying and obsessive and, um, and, Again, if I'm perfecting my craft by playing Dwight or attempting to play a better and better version of Dwight, um, then I'm in worship. And ultimately at the end of the day, one of the most gratifying things about playing Dwight is all of the people who say, who say and continue to say, the office brought me such solace during a really difficult period of my life. And uh, it moved me and made me laugh. And as my, um, uh, you know, my parents were getting a divorce or my sister was sick and we watched the office and it laughed. And I realized like, oh, it was also a great service. It's been a great service to people. We didn't necessarily set out to make the office as a service to humanity. I mean, we were, I was trying to get, I was trying to pay off my student loans. <laughs> you know, I was trying to make some money and, you know, get a job. And, um, but it ended up being this great service. I'm gonna share my screen with some other quotes here. Some other thoughts from a Baha'i perspective about the arts. Baha'u'llah says, arts, crafts, and sciences uplift the world of being and are conducive to its exaltation. 
specifically about music, Baha'u'llah says, we have made music a ladder by which souls may ascend to the realm on high. Didn't we feel that a little bit with the song that was played at the beginning? I know it really helped attune my soul up the ladder toward the realm on high. Abdul Baha says the acquisition of sciences and the perfection of arts are considered acts of worship. So here's two quotes that link sciences and arts, which are very rarely linked in other contexts. But if you take the largest spiritual macro view of why we're here on this planet, we're here to be of service, we're here to make ourselves better human being, beings, excuse me, and we're here to help humanity advance, uh, to create, as Baha'u'llah says, an ever advancing civilization. Um, Baha'u'llah says, let your vision be world embracing and pursuit of arts and crafts and sciences uplift the world of being and ultimately are of tremendous service. The final quote here is, all art is a gift of the Holy Spirit. These gifts are fulfilling their highest purpose when showing forth the praise of God. So art is a gift of the Holy Spirit. We could do a whole talk just on that, like what is the Holy Spirit and how does the Holy Spirit bestow upon us gifts? So this, you know, it's the idea of the muse, you know, the ancient idea like that artists would say, well, this doesn't come from me, it comes from some other source. And then it expresses that other source. So there's this kind of duality, this kind of conversation between the Holy Spirit and the artist. And that this, this art is fulfilling its highest purpose when showing forth the praise of God. Um, the last thing I'll say on this, and I had a quote and I couldn't find it, um, but, uh, the last thing I'll say is about the, when seeking transcendence through both spirituality and art, we, as Baha'is often, as when we say prayers, we say the titles of the names of God. This is also very common in Islam. That God is, we can't know God but we can know the qualities of God. We can certainly know, we can't know God, but we can know beauty. We can't know God, but we can know truth. We can't know God, but we can know compassion. So as we focus on the qualities of God and seeing them in other people and seeing them in nature and seeing them in art and seeing them in the sciences, then we attune our hearts toward God, towards knowing God. And one of the titles of God in the Baha'i faith is creator. And another one is fashioner. So we humans seek to emulate these titles of God. We seek to be compassionate. We seek to create beauty. We seek to be more kind. We seek to be more loving. As artists, we seek to be creators and we seek to be fashioners. When that song was played at the beginning of this presentation, you know, there was an awkward silence and we went over to a YouTube video and then all of a sudden where there had been nothing, there were notes, as Baha'u'llah says, that allow us to ascend, the, la the soul to ascend by a ladder. So, when there's an empty stage and then there's a play, when there's an empty piece of paper and then there's a piece of art, <coughs> when uh, there's silence in a room and then someone plays a piece of music, this is fashioning, this is emulating the, one of the powers of God, one of the qualities of the divine. So there is a sacredness to to the creation of art that is synonymous with worship. And I could, I suppose, go into a whole thing about sacredness, um, which we won't have time to, because I want to leave time for questions and whatnot. But those are just some thoughts 
about art and transcendence and realizing that my kind of life's journey and my life's purpose really is the integration of, you know, again, it's this, it's the question that I get asked the most. It's like, why is the guy who played Dwight, if people can't wrap their heads around, why is the annoying guy who played Dwight interested in spirituality? And so the, the integration between being an actor, being a comedian, um, the service that it provides, the striving to pray or worship um, by making the making of art, the, the striving to integrate all of these various compartments of my life in, in the same way that, a, let's say, a Native American um, piece of pottery or a rug might integrate all of these uh, forces into one cohesive whole like the body, um, and finally to, to emulate that quality of the divine, the creator, the fashioner. Um, so that's really what I wanted to share with you guys. And uh, I'm open to just having a conversation. There's a chat function at the, um, at the bottom um, of the page. And, um, Paimane, do you want to do you want to MC that, or do you want me to? Um, yeah, I can I can read the questions out loud, and you can answer them. Okay, great. Okay, great. So thank you so much. Um, our first question is by um, Brigida, and she asks, "How did you navigate sharing or not sharing the Baha'i faith in your work?" Well, I didn't. I didn't uh, navigate that. I shared the Baha'i faith. My feeling is that uh, the Baha'i faith is the thing I love maybe the most in the world, maybe even more than art. I know that's crazy. By the way, if you want to see what I'm talking about with art, I just moved into this office. So this is what Zoom can afford you. And here's all, all the paintings that I haven't yet been able to hang they're all stacked all over the place. Anyway, um, so yeah, I didn't navigate that. I just shared the Baha'i faith because I share what I love. And if you don't share what you love, for those people who are Baha'is, if you love the Baha'i faith and you're not sharing it, then you don't really love it because you share what you love. If you love sushi, you share your love of sushi. If you love the movie Blade Runner, you share your love of the movie Blade Runner. If you love tennis, you share your love of tennis. So um, super important to, to, share, to, share, uh, to share our hearts and share what we love so that we can live in a greater integration. That's my opinion. People may feel differently. Our next question is from Nima Izadi. Um, faith and religion often mandates that we moderate our art, creativity, and comedy for the sake of chastity and spiritual development. Yet comedy and any art form should push boundaries often, whether through odd and inappropriate jokes, complicated storylines, or other examples like nude paintings. As a person of faith, how do you moderate your art? Is it even possible to moderate art? Were there roles you had to turn down because of their extreme or risque nature? Thanks for your work and efforts. Wow, great question. Very smart question. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. And if you ask 10 different artists this question, they're gonna have 10 different answers. But um, Baha'u'llah also teaches moderation in all things. Um, and yes, this has, this has always been a struggle. It's a struggle, especially for comedians, because like the questioner says, part of comedy, part of what makes us laugh is pushing a boundary and stepping over a line and getting that kind of like, oh, kind of reaction. So, but to do that, sometimes you have to step way over the line and be offensive. And sometimes you don't step enough over the line and you don't quite go there. So you're trying to always walk that balance. And I, I speak to a lot of other Baha'i performers and comedians like Omi Jalili in England is a very well-known stand-up comic and he always is having issues with this. In fact, he's had Baha'is write letters to institutions about his jokes and say, he shouldn't be telling a joke about testicles. <laughs> He's a Baha'i, you know, and it's, 
it's a really interesting um, line to walk and it's a difficult one, but you know, we all walk that same line as Baha'is and whatever we do and as accountants or insurance adjusters or school teachers or whatever we do, we're trying to walk that line between our, our faith and what we feel is right in the context of the modern world. So yes, I think modesty is important and there's been many roles that I've turned down because they are so offensive. And I felt like the, the piece of work that they were in uh, did not make the world a better place. Uh, that, being done, that being said, I've also taken roles that, you know, when I look back on it now, like would I have taken that part 10, 12 years ago that I, now I've, with what I know, it probably wouldn't have. I wish I hadn't have done that. Um, it's a very, it's an extremely tricky balance uh, to walk. So, but again, if we take the macro view of the purpose of art, it's to create a ladder for souls. It's to give praise to the almighty God. It's to give service. It's again, to be a fashioner in the same way that God, the creator is a creator. There was a blank canvas of the universe and then there was the big bang and all of a sudden time and energy and matter were all, uh, were all brought into being uh, at the exact same split second. I mean, what greater thing to emulate is there uh, than that? But yeah, I've turned down roles that have been um, really egregiously uh, morally repugnant. Um, and then I've taken some roles that are like morally dubious, but ultimately I, I hoped that the project itself had enough good aspects to uh, help make the world a better place. And it's an interesting thing as an actor too, because as an actor, I may be called upon to play a rapist. I may be called upon to play a racist. I may be called upon to be doing things that I wouldn't do as a Baha'i, but it's in service to the greater story. I'm a part of a storytelling. I'm, I'm one part of the limbs or members and parts of the body that are uh, attempting to tell a, an even greater story. So I have to look at that, the, the, the ultimate purpose of that greater story. And sometimes, frankly, just making people laugh is a great service. Our next question is from Nassim. As a parent of two daughters just budding into adulthood, ages 17 and 20, they have a tremendous love for the faith, but sometimes express that it is too idealistic to be practical in their day-to-day -day life. I don't think they question its authenticity, but do you have any words of wisdom to suggest? Perhaps the question is, what words of wisdom would you have for your younger self? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't really have any answers to that. I have a 15 year old son who's almost 16. Um, and the teachings of the Baha'i faith are extremely idealistic. Uh, when I was a kid in the seventies, people talked about world peace all the time. Everyone talked about world peace. It was the goal. I hope we can achieve world peace. Um, beauty contestants would say, I want world peace, you know? And now that's become a joke. Like if you talk about world peace, everyone is cynical. They think that you're full of crap. It's never gonna happen, never gonna happen. Most people believe it's never gonna happen because humans are too messed up and too selfish and will never be able to achieve world peace. Um, and I think, you know, to quote John Lennon, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I think that uh, the teachings of Baha'u'llah, I think, I think world peace is, is necessary and achievable. It may be achieved only after some great and terrible lessons that humanity learns about, you know, blood running in the streets from, you know, racial injustice, from, from climate change, who knows what, from militarization, from uh, immorality and consumerism, who knows what, but, uh, Again, we have to, to hearken back to the first thing that I said, all people, but Baha'is especially, are on a twofold spiritual path to make ourselves better people and to make the world a better place. Essentially, there's a lot more to it than that. And so 
I would say maybe suggest working with the daughters on both of those. Like what teachings of the Baha'i faith, really small, like what teaching today from the Baha'i faith can make you a better person today? For instance, possess a pure, kindly and radiant heart. Can we just have our hearts be 10% more pure, kindly and radiant today? And then what, what teachings from the Baha'i faith can we use to make the world a better place? Maybe a quote on service or something like that. And like, can we just achieve a little bit of service today? So a little bit of a more pure heart and a little bit more service. And then day, little by little, day by day, as Abdul Baha would say, we increase and go down both of those paths. Next question is from Julius. What do you think about art censoring that is happening to a lot of art this year, like the part from the office um, where you can see someone with blackface? Yes. Um, yeah, I think that there, believe it or not, I think there's some censoring that's good. I think that um, obviously, I mean, you take blackface, for instance, and uh, it has a grotesque, painful, horrific legacy um, that for so many people of color, friends of mine of color, I, I, I can't speak to it, but I have heard their pain around it and their outrage. And then for a while in the 80s and 90s, and you know, uh, there were, you know, it was kind of like making fun of it and poking out, oh, this person's being inappropriate by doing it. So trying to kind of like, again, what's that line that comedy is like sometimes goes too far and pushes too far to try and get a laugh and to be a little bit offensive and titillating in how, how offensive it goes and that it has moved um, too far. And it's, it's time to um, sensitivity toward the pain of, um, that a, uh, someone might be feeling and compassion towards that person and, and humility and, uh, and a deep empathy is far more important right now than getting those kind of laughs. There's lots of other ways that we can get laughs. So I, I, I'm, in, I'm in support of that. Obviously, you know, it's, it's a slippery slope if we start censoring art. Uh, anything that's remotely offensive to anyone gets pulled, then we're, we're in trouble because um, That, that, that's very difficult, that's very difficult to, to monitor. And one of the reasons the office was successful in this regard was because you had Michael and Dwight as two of the leads that were so, they're so crass and insensitive and clueless that they can get away with saying this stuff and the other characters, how the other characters react to what they're saying is shows how off base it is. Um, so it, it's a fun way to, to play with those dynamics. Um, the next question is sort of along the same lines, but Niku asks to piggyback off what others have asked, is there a limit to the extent to which art can be spiritual or transcendent or are satirical body offensive or otherwise boundary pushing art still be a force for spiritual growth? Yeah, I mean, I would say that when I was in New York City studying theater, I did a lot of studying of clown. And clowning is an incredible art form that can be very scatological. And there's just fart jokes and dick jokes and uh, a plenty. And when I've seen certain performances that were so virtuosic and, uh, and hysterical that they become transcendent. Um, it's very rare that they can, but that uh, you're showing, you know, because we have penises and we fart and you're showing the human condition and you're making us laugh. And uh, I've, I've had transcendent experiences seeing uh, comedy um, move in that direction. I think some stand-up comics uh, are amazing at this as well. You know, I think that uh, 
you know, Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock, they're some, some that are, can be incredibly crass, but ultimately you're laughing so much and they're illuminating the human condition to such an extent that um, there is a transcendence in that work. But it's, it's very careful because ultimately, uh, uh, I would say, if you were gonna leave today with one quote, I would say this, like 99% of penises jokes don't work. <laughs> Um, Ethan asks, how do you integrate spirituality into instrumental music? Since there are no lyrics, what are other ways to communicate a message with an audience? You gotta listen to John Coltrane's A Love Supreme and uh, you'll, you'll see. There's, there's uh, infinite, um, infinite examples of, of this. Um, I got a message from Faraz. He says, have you been able to talk to Russell Brand about the faith? He seems receptive. Yes, I interviewed Russell Brand on Soul Pancake. You can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, really, I know Russell well, and we're in touch a lot. And he knows that I'm a Baha'i. Um, and yeah, I love what he's doing in his conversations around addiction and recovery and around spirituality, meditation. Um, and his podcast is, is incredibly brilliant. And uh, he's, he's very much in alignment uh, with the Baha'i faith. But again, as speaking to the Baha'is here, it's not about converting people to the Baha'i faith. It's about finding allies that want to work together to make the world a better place and that want to use and focus on using spiritual tools in toward that end, that there can be spiritual solutions to some of the world's issues. And, uh, and he's a great ally to the Baha'is in, in his elevated discussions uh, around these topics. Um, Ryan asks, how do you envision using the arts to build a global community? Um, I don't really have a vision for that, but we saw it, an evidence of the song that began today. If, um, and again, did you put the link down to everyone? Did you send the link of the song to everyone? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And that's a beautiful building of global community through music. Um, I think ultimately in the 60s and the 70s, it was the arts that united people and brought people together. There was an incredible, um, through music, through the Beatles, through Cat Stevens, through John Coltrane, um, uh, and, and Miles Davis, it was music that united people and fueled the movement towards positive social change. So uh, I believe that ultimately the arts will help um, fuel a spiritual change in humanity. I don't know exactly how, but I'd love to be a part of it, but I might be too old, so. Um, we have a question here. I don't know if you can really speak to it, but like, what do you think is, you know, the correct approach for Christians to take in terms of Christ or idolizing him or not? Um, uh, I'm looking for the actual question. Do you have, oh. Do you believe it is correct for Christians to idolize Christ? Um, well, I can't really speak to what someone else should do. The, this is a much larger question and an, and an interesting question, which has to do with the role of the prophet the role of the manifestation of God, Baha'is call them manifestations of God. Are they God? Are they man? Are they a combination of both? Are they 60 man, 40 God? Are they 90 man, 10 God? You know, to the Buddhist, the Buddha had achieved Nirvana. He was a man who achieved Bodhisattva and enlightenment. And in so doing, became kind of a god, but really was an enlightened, totally enlightened man. To the Christians, 
Jesus was the son of God, literally, even though Jesus never called himself the son of God, which is an interesting thing to look up. Jesus called himself the son of man, but others after he had died said he was the son of God. Um, and so to the Christians, he's a piece of God walking around on planet earth and he's part of God. You understand God through the father, the son and the Holy spirit to the Muslims, Muhammad, peace be upon him is a, 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 a messenger. He is a spokesperson for God. He is not, uh, now he's to be revered. His station is to be revered, but he is not any kind of like God walking around on earth. He's a humble man. And the angel Gabriel spoke through him and he was the messenger, the mouthpiece of God, the friend of God. So these are three very different ways of looking at um, these divine manifestations, these divine and holy teachers, these divine physicians walking around on planet earth. And for the Baha'is, it falls somewhere in the middle. That Baha'u'llah is very much a man and also very much, I wanna say a God, but very much divine and having a separate station than a human being. So, but, you know, at the same time, Baha'u'llah had many of, the, you know, he had a corporal body. And um, so is it right for Christians to idolize Jesus? Like, yeah, if you believe that Jesus is the son of God and kind of God walking around on planet earth, then yeah, it's entirely correct. But um, it's just something to explore of um, this concept of divine manifestation and what that really means. It's an incredibly profound mystery and worthy of a great deal of reading and study. So I have a private question from Kristen. When you talk about spiritual tools to people who aren't Baha'is, how do you describe that beyond a strictly religious context? Well, that's a great question. So it's easy. Humanity has always adopted spiritual tools. Most people that meditate uh, are not quote unquote religious. Meditation has been greatly adopted by the secular left in the cities of America and the yoga studios of people who are atheist or agnostic. So that's a great spiritual tool um, that has been brought to us since the dawn of man. I mean, we're talking about the Upanishads the Vedas that were written, you know, 5,000, 10,000 BC, they don't even know how old. Um, so that's a spiritual tool. I think that Baha'is put a great deal of focus on the virtues when we've spoken about the virtues, kindness, compassion, humility, honesty, etc. Now we know these are spiritual virtues that are signs of God. They're um, brought um, they're emulating God by emulating these qualities. But you can easily look at those virtues as leadership qualities and positive character traits. Um, when you start to look at gratitude is, uh, is a spiritual quality that has been greatly explored and studied in the field of positive psychology. You can look on Huffington Post or anywhere online and find all kinds of articles about gratitude and the psychological benefits of gratitude. But gratitude is a tremendous part of every spiritual tradition and ultimately giving gratitude towards God for the bounties that we have and for what we have. So these, these and so many more are spiritual tools that can make our lives better and we can use them and work hand in hand with them. Um, uh, with people that aren't uh, religious and find that commonality. As Baha'is were asked to have elevated discussions, to be in a constant process of elevated discussions with our friends and cohorts and coworkers and family members. And this is a great area to explore in that context. Um, we have another question about whether you thought the blackface scene was bad enough to be deleted. I think you already touched on it that you know, yes. So just in the interest of time, I'll move on to the next question. Well, no, I will say that there, there's a, uh, when the, in the office, there's an episode where there's uh, 
celebrating Christmas um, and Dwight is playing Belschnickel and uh, who's a ancient European kind of version of Santa, but he's like a mean Santa Claus. And in the Belgian tradition, I think, he has a sidekick named Black Peter. Um, and this has been in Belgian custom for thousand years where you've got, you, you can Google it and you see, I, I think it's Belgium if I have the right country right. And they have, the, and they wear a black face. Um, different context than blackface in the United States, but nonetheless offensive. And so this scene is being deleted from the office. They're literally just excising. It's about three seconds of screen time where someone Googles Black Peter and they're like, good thing Black Peter's not showing up today. And then you see Dwight's reaction and then Dwight's little sidekick is walking across the parking lot with dressed as Black Peter with blackface and Dwight calls him on his phone and Dwight's like, yeah, don't come, abort, turn around, go away. And, and then that's it and it's, and it's gone. But we have um, deleted that, that scene from the office. Um, Paymon asks, would you be able to share what impact Soul Pancake has had and some comments you have received and how others can also start similar projects to make a change? Sure. Um, you know, that's, that's a difficult question to ask uh, or to answer. Soul Pancake has over a billion video views uh, making uplifting content. Um, its initial impetus was inspired by the Baha'i teachings and writings, but it's not a Baha'i site at all. We don't talk about the Baha'i faith or promote the Baha'i faith or anything like that. But positive, we made an impact in terms of being a pioneer in positive social media. We were a for-profit company trying to make an impact um, in media by with positive content. And we were there before Upworthy or A plus or so many of the other companies. So we were kind of helping to lead the way in this in this way. And I think that, you know, Abdul Baha and Shogi Effendi, Shogi Effendi is another leader of the Baha'i faith or in early in its history, talk about Baha'is being the leaven. Do we know what leaven is? Do people know what leaven is? So if you're, make, if you're baking bread and you just have water and flour and you bake it, it's gonna be hard as a rock. So what makes bread bread? Well, it's yeast, which is essentially a, a, a bacteria, um, uh, almost a bad bacteria that kind of you put in and then it allows the bread to be bread. I'm not a baker, I don't know the details of this. But this is, the bacteria has a leavening agent which allows the bread to expand. So this analogy is used a great deal in the Baha'i faith, that Baha'is are the leaven of the world. So again, speaking to my Baha'i brothers and sisters, this is not about converting people to the Baha'i faith. This is about elevated discussions finding allies that want to work with us to make the, the world a better place and um, being the leaven to help show the show the way. Now you can be the leaven if you're a school teacher at an elementary school, you can start a race amity day, you know, a race friendship day um, at your elementary school. And maybe that's the way that you're the leaven, you know, of your particular milieu. And maybe it spreads. You know, it's all about making that positive impact in whatever field you're in to help an elevated discussion, to help increase service, you know, inspired by the teachings of, of Baha'u'llah. Now, that being said, for those of you who are watching who are not Baha'is, we certainly welcome you to become a Baha'i. You may read about the Baha'i faith and Baha'u'llah and, and go, oh my gosh, this guy is amazing. I believe that he is a divine teacher for this day and age. I want to join what the Baha'is are doing, six million around the world, working to make the world a better place, gathering together and achieving unity and diversity. I want to be a part of that. That's great. But 
the point of this talk and of our interactions with the public with the public is not to convert but to to work with um anyway i'll stop there um erwin asks any comment on why members of historically oppressed minorities are often some of the best comedians yeah you um sure I mean, there's so much to say. I can't speak to that from just being a, a white dude. I, I wouldn't know, but I will say that comedy is often born of pain and people of color and oppressed peoples have experienced a great deal of pain and their parents have and their families have. And so it gives them a particular insight into pain, suffering and oppression and then uh, an ability to comment on that. Um, so, I, I think there's many other reasons um, that I'm not really qualified to go into there, but I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you guys for your time and thanks for having me. And um, uh, it's nice to see your lovely faces wherever you may be, Northern Virginia and other parts. And um, is uh, part of, for those of you joining, for those of you who, who might be interested in more information about the Baha'i faith, one of the things Baha'is do is they gather for devotional gatherings. So they gather for prayer meetings and meditation meetings. So please contact uh, the Baha'i community. Um, you can go to here, I'm gonna put it, I'll put it in here. Give me a second. You can find out more information at Baha'i.org or 1-800-22-UNITE. Uh, um, is a phone is a phone and um, there's also uh, service projects going on classes for children classes for junior youth and teenagers and uh, study groups that are really fun to be a part of called the Ruhi courses that are kind of digging into these topics like the arts like service um, life after death prayer the purpose of prayer um, and you can join a Ruhi study group and find one in your area if you're interested in learning more, participating more. So those are just a couple things to keep in mind. Thank you so much again. We all really enjoyed that. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to meet with us very early in California. <laughs> um, so I wanted to announce our speaker and topic for next week, July 5th. Our speaker will be Bayan Parhami and the topic will be Just Imagine a World Without Boundaries. And then the following week, July 12th, our speaker will be Masood Oufani, who is an Atlanta-based actor, mixed media artist, and writer. And again, these services are open to all, so please invite your friends and family, coworkers. Um, now I'm going to play a closing prayer.
Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye.